All right, so today is a little bit of a departure from the typical videos that I have, but a lot of you have been asking, what the heck do I do for a living? So for those of you that don't know, YouTube is not my full-time job. I actually make absolutely no money on what I do here. I just do this because I like to give back to the community and I love seeing everyone's comments and emails about how these videos have really helped them through things that they just didn't understand or things that they really got on board with and it really changed a lot of what they're doing um, in their schoolwork and in their in their day jobs as well. So um, I do have one rule on my channel and that is I don't uh, say exactly where I work because this channel is all mine. I don't do this through work, work at all. Um, of course, if you know me on LinkedIn, this is kind of silly because you can look up where I work. <laughs> Um, so if you are interested, that's where you would find that. But everything I go over on this channel is, um, you know, inspired by things that I see going on in the community, questions that I get from people, um, helping people out when they ask, like, well, what what is this? What does this mean? I don't understand it. A lot of inspiration for the videos comes from just questions from everyday people uh, in the industry and other trends that I see going on in the industry as well. So I thought what might be interesting is today I am going to walk you through what I actually do for my day job. The other thing is I wanna just preface this video by saying this is not a promotional video. Everything I'm showing you here is just because I've had a lot of people ask me like, what do I do? And the things I'm going to be showing you in this video, all of these things are public knowledge. If you look, if you go to any presentation that I do at a conference, this is the same kind of stuff that you're going to hear. So just putting that out there. But I am going to take you behind the scenes a little bit on the product that I work on um, because Knowledge Graph, of course, is, is at least the one I'm working on is search based and that's behind the scenes, but I can actually show you something as well. And that's what we'll go over in this video, as well as like, what are my responsibilities and duties? So that if you wanna find out like, what does a knowledge graph person do? This person that I watch and maybe subscribe to, what does she actually do for a living? This is kind of what that video, this video is all about. Also, this video is really hopefully gonna inspire you and really help you kind of get some, from some groundwork on what do you do with the skills that you have if you don't already have a job? Or if you do have a job, what does everybody else in the market do that kind of does what you do? So if you have any questions, if you want any advice on, you know, finding jobs or understanding your place in all of this, please leave them in the comments down below or send me an email. My email is actually in every single description box, by the way. And I have a whole series on, you know, some tips and tricks on, you know, resume writing and that sort of thing that I will also put down below. All right. So with that, let's go get started. So I am the director of Knowledge Graph, Semantic Search and MLAI at the company that is my day job. <laughs> and basically what that means is the platform part is um, search at the company I work for goes across all different products. So I work on all the search across all the products. Uh, and that's pretty cool because there's a lot of them and they have a lot of things that are unique to each product. So I get to deal with all of those. Platform also means that I am a part of a art, which is an agile release train. So think of it as a bunch of little like five to seven um people development teams all underneath one bucket that is all working on search and search things. Uh, so that is, is what that platform part means as well. Now I am a director, which means I am testing out what the developers do. I am helping uh, the folks that report to me write user stories and features, get those acceptance criteria, but I'm also looking towards the future and trying to connect the dots between what we do today at the company and what we're going to do tomorrow and how do we get there? And how is that going to impact our business and our users? So that's a big part of what I do. And you can see a lot of these trends show up in my channel as well because I'm oftentimes talking about how do you get buy-in from stakeholders? How do you test uh, the, if the model is going to work well? What are the questions you need to ask yourself about, you know, getting a new vendor or a new tool? I do a lot of that in my day job. And so a lot of what I'm imparting to you is 
a lot of my hands-on experience and, you know, my mentorship uh, based on the things that I've experienced in my background, as well as, you know, when I'm doing even consulting things on the side, sometimes when people ask me questions and, you know, want me to do a little speech or a little talk with with their 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 teams, I do that as well. And I get a lot of really interesting use cases. And that's where a lot of the use cases on this channel come from is not only the things that I do in my day job, although again, I keep that kind of quiet. I don't really talk about that market specifically because it is my day job. Um, but I do talk about a lot of the uh, quasi, you know, like sister markets and and the markets that I do a lot of research in and a lot of my past experience um, on on in different uh, jobs that I've had. So all of this goes into what this channel is. Now, the other thing is you heard me talk about some direct reports. I actually have uh, two main groups that report to me. And that's where that semantic search, knowledge graph, and um, MLEI come in. So semantic search is kind of like the bucket of stuff that I oversee is making sure semantic search works on all the products and what all that means and where it's going, all that. Um, but I also uh, own the teams that do that work. So one is a development team of knowledge graph folks and ETL folks and folks that are doing a lot of the pipeline work, as well as more pipeline work, but more on the full tech side um, in the MLEI space with machine learning engineers. So what makes me effective at my job is I know how to do the tech myself. I get to experiment with it. I get to see what's going on. And I also get to help them along the journey as they develop more things um, in my day job. All right, so I promised you that I was going to go over the actual product that you can maybe see a little bit more about the knowledge graph that I work on. And as I said, again, this is totally public. I am gonna walk you through some of the knowledge graph things throughout this so that you can see what it's all about. Again, don't take this as promotional. It's really just, maybe satisfying some of your curiosity. And I really enjoy what I do, so I wanted to share it with you all as well. All right, so let me go and jump into that. All right, so let's kick this off by talking about what problems are we solving with this product, as well as which persona. As I go through, I will also talk about the behind the scenes graph work that goes into this, as well as some of the other search use cases that we use this graph for. So the main persona we are talking about here is the market that I am primarily working in right now is the scholarly research. So primarily talking about students or faculty, as well as folks in the corporate market that are doing R&D. Now on the R&D side, um, something that is really helpful with what we're doing here is, yeah, could you do some research on Google? scholar even? Yeah, of course. And they make a lot of money off of their patents and their technology. So if you are in the corporate market and you are doing research on Google or Google Scholar, keep that in mind that there are folks looking at what you're doing, which is a big reason why a lot of people select to go with something that is not on the public web, which is what we're talking about here. Now, I also want to preface this by saying this is a product that is associated with a more traditional search experience as well. So you don't always have to use this visual interpretation or this analytics tool, but it is something that for the student, we have this view, which we call the ball and stick view, which is you know a very traditional graph look. So that is to make it more visually appealing for students where they want a fun factor to their research just so they stay engaged. The other persona we're talking about are librarians. and They're not as keen on the fun factor because they just wanna get in, get their work done and move on. So we have two other views that are more analyst or information professional uh, specific, and that's called grid view, which I kind of feel is like a Netflix-like view where you get a lot more data um, if that's what you're looking for as well as the AR VR view, which is where you can actually look at this graph, but in a triangulation kind of view, or what are the commonalities that are between them? 
and we'll walk through what that looks like as well. So those are the main persona and kind of views that go along with those persona. So there's four main problems that we are addressing with this tool. So the first one is just disambiguation. You can even see that here on the screen. So there are a lot of folks that just don't know the right words to search for. When you type in Java, they might not realize there are many different types of Java. So there's Java, Java the programming language, Java the island, and then there's also JavaScript. You can see that kind of at the bottom. And then there's this natural language form of Java, my cup of joe in the morning. It's another word for coffee. So that's one thing that we're doing is anything that you see on the screen here is a hype. This is the hypergraph that you're seeing in the visual. But behind the scenes is the true, you know, big bulky graph that we have, which is actually taking all of the subjects from all the different publishers and all the different content that we have. And we are mapping them together because they don't agree all the time either, those subjects. And we are also adding in the user's natural language. So what does that mean? So we are looking at, we're doing some card sorting exercises to actually ask them and get in, and gather their natural language when they're doing like word association. Uh, we are also looking at the search logs and the author keyword uh, field, as well as some linked data sources to understand what are some other words that people use in their common discourse, which is what you and I say to each other when we're talking, or more commonly, when you are trying to figure out what to search for, you always kind of revert back to your natural language. We are mapping those in so that you no longer have a barrier to entry, which is so important. And you hear me talk about this all the time on this channel. So that's what you're seeing here. We have all of that mapped together. And then when you have like-minded things mapped together, you then create the hyper class, which is what you're seeing here on the screen. The other thing that we are doing is we are helping with search refinement. So what does that mean? We can understand based on the query, if somebody has searched on something that is too broad, like cancer, we can say, oh, hey, there are more specific terms you might want to add to that query so it gets better, so you don't have a million different things to look at. We also know if you have a more specific term that you have searched for, and maybe you don't get a lot of results. Maybe you only get like one, two, three, and that's it. That's maybe the best you know experience for you if you're looking for that one exact article, but oftentimes it also is an indicator that maybe your search is way too specific. So we can then also show you some examples that you can add to your search to broaden it just slightly so you maybe get better results. The other two areas that we help with, a lot of people don't know how to do complex query building and that's fine and a lot of people shouldn't be required to learn all of that. So what we're doing is we're kind of holding the hand of the, the end user through that experience we are giving like one kind of Boolean operator, which is the and or, but other than that, we are constructing this complex query behind the scenes so they don't have to, and they still get a great search experience from it. The last thing is more on the analyst and maybe like R&D side of things, where we're going to show how we use AR VR technology to allow someone to do kind of triangulation. If I am searching on these three drugs, how do I know what things those drugs have in common? Common areas for that is if you're doing a dissertation, maybe that's an area that doesn't have a lot of research associated with it because it's how three things that are maybe seemingly not related are actually related in some way. That's only possible with graph. Um, and that's a great area for your dissertation because there's not a lot of research in that space quite yet. On the R&D side, on the corporate side, hey, if these three things that you're working on have this maybe hidden area first, maybe that's an area you need to look at if it's maybe a potential risk, but also could be a potential market. So if you are trying to figure out what your next project should be to invest in, maybe it's something that a lot of your other projects have in common, or maybe it's a hidden market or a hidden area that you can um, sell to that's an area that Knowledge Graph is really powerful for. So we'll get into that as well. 
So here you'll see how we help the user drill into what did they actually mean when they searched for Java? That's, that's the query here. So we're doing that disambiguation with an image, a label, and the definition. So the user has multiple access points into understanding if this is really what they meant. So now I have oriented myself to Java. So what you're seeing here on the screen is my center node, which is my central research topic as well as all of the related topics. Now, here is where some cool stuff happens behind the scenes. So these are the top 25. Now, we use a way of looking at the top 25. They are relevant, but there's also a relatedness score. So how related is anything on the screen? Because you don't wanna paint on the screen only the most uh, related because some things might be slightly a stretch, but that's actually maybe a great place. It gives that inquisitiveness to your users. So they're like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that was related. And it might actually give them even more fruitful results that they weren't expecting. That unexpected benefit is something that keeps people coming back. So we actually do a mix of those things. And we are looking at the relations specifically and how thing, how far away, how many hops in the graph you have to go to get to that node to then display a mix of things on the screen. We also have personalization. So if you come in and you, we know that you are um, a faculty member and you really know your stuff, we are going to use our depth of knowledge score, which is these are really specific and really well-known things, um, that is going to be for maybe the, the first level of knowledge. Like first blush, I know, you know, Java is some kind of programming language. Cool, okay. But if you're very, very deep in your understanding of a topic, we're going to start to surface things to you that are maybe more obscure. And we have different mechanisms behind the scenes to do that, but we're, we're really trying to tailor this to the user's experience and who that user actually is. So as you see here, as I'm going, I can start to add things to my query builder. So one thing you'll see is each of these nodes also has its own metadata. So that hypergraph, remember all the data behind the scenes, probably all the other vocabularies and the natural language, and they probably have all their own metadata associated with them, and they do. But this hypergraph also, each class has its own information. So the information we have is an image, and this image is very specific. It's not just a generic. Um, you'll see some generic ones, like you'll see the one that looks like a computer screen. We do that because some images are not high enough quality. Maybe they're just very um, metaphysical, like there's not really a good image to describe what this thing is. Um, there's also things that might be offensive and we don't want to show something. So that's where you'll see some of those generic ones pop in. But for the most part, we are using real images that make sense for this topic. You'll also see that we have the label. Coming soon is going to be, you know, synonyms, common synonyms for this label. We have our definition. We also have a discipline. The reason we have a discipline is because, again, we're trying to give as many access points for refinement. If you are a new student and you're coming in and you don't really know if this is the correct context for you or not, you can use the domain or the discipline and say, oh, wait, 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 I'm a, a computer science major, so let me just filter on that and I'll get a better result for me and, and my research that I'm doing. You'll also see the relationships. This is one of my favorite parts of the graph that you can see. I can actually learn something just from that relationship. That's the semantics, that's the semantic search. Of course, semantic search is also question answering, right? So if I wanted to type in to the traditional search engine, um, what programming languages influenced Java? I can parse that based on the graph and give answers. And you can see here, Boolean, this is the only Boolean operator we have in here because all the rest of it is kind of behind the scenes where we're rewriting the query before we send it back to the traditional uh, search results. But we'll also see the content preview here. So we're giving a little snapshot to the user to make sure that they have a waypoint to say, oh yeah, 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 that makes sense. That's, that's kind of the direction I'm trying to go in. And you can see here, I just added another node because I had, a lot of results because I had an or in there, but now I've added something else and you can see the preview results went from a million to only 22,000. So you can actually see the benefits of refinement as you go. Now you'll see sometimes related to, that's more of a generic 
uh, relation. And that's coming from the, the hierarchies of some of the control vocabularies where we know they're related, but taxonomies and thesauri are not as semantic. So we don't know exactly how they're related. That's something that we're going to go back and we're going to mine more specific relations from our full text. And that's where a lot of these relationships are coming from is either the control vocabularies, linked data resources that are authoritative and that we trust, as well as our full text. And most of them are from the full text. And you can see here, I'm doing search on many different things. I don't have to just keep the first graph, the first paint. These are not mini graphs. This is one giant graph. It's just the query that we're painting on the screen of the top 25. So now you'll see here, I'm going to jump into a totally different area with Walt Disney. Now, the relations with people are actually really cool. There's a lot more of them. And so here we're going to see a little bit more of that question and answer stuff where I can say, okay, here's all this cool stuff about Walt Disney, but what if I wanted to find out how he died? That's interesting. Cause of death, right? Like I'm keeping that intrigue going. And now I have my answer. So if I was looking for that answer first, I could just type it into the search bar in the traditional. But if I come in here, I can actually see how these two things are related with only two clicks. Now, I'm going to show you an example here of how we're mapping in that natural language. So I type in Zoloft, which is the drug name, and now I can see the more generic term for that. Again, we're breaking down those barriers to entry. If the only word I know for this is Zoloft, I can still get to what I want. All right, so I have just jumped over into, so what we were looking at before was the interactive view, now we're in the grid view. So you can see this is more like a Netflix style where we have these swim lanes. So this, this big open area is where we put like some of the upsells that we have. And you can see that we still have the image. You can still see that we have uh, the label, the domain definition, all of that. Now, what's interesting is you can go down here and you can look at the relations, right? Those are the swim lanes. And you can see a lot more on the screen because these swim lanes will allow you to keep going. So if I was interested in, you know, exploring one of these concepts, I can keep digging in and looking at how these things are related to each other. And I can keep adding them to my search. And you can see that my, my query is being constructed for me. A lot of analysts like this because they can really get into the nitty gritty. And you can also see a lot of that, that research. It's, it's hidden a little bit more here um, so that you have to select to dig in, but it's there because that's what the analyst is, is really preferring. So let's go back to the interactive view and see how once you start to dig into these topics, you can start to string them together and use the AR VR function. And by the way, you can use this just in the 3D view on your screen. You don't actually have to have all the equipment for some of the other stuff, but it is an option for you. But this is how you can find how there is hidden relations between things, something you can only do with graph nearest neighbor, all of that stuff behind the scenes so that you can see the singularity search. So you'll see that I'm stringing a few things together here. So you can see here, this is one of the ones that had a lot of connections to it. I'm going to add it to my search. And that's the thing, That's this is not just a toy. This is not just a cool interface. We can actually use this to drill into something that maybe is something that we can invest more in if this is not on our radar today, if it's something else that really makes sense to our business because it has a lot of overlap with other tools or products or drugs that we, we are working on. If I'm a student, this helps me understand, oh, these things might have a common uh, denominator that I didn't know about and that doesn't actually show up in the search results or in the research very much maybe that's a good place for me to start my research so that my article or my dissertation has more impact. And with that, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I'll catch you next time.